So in this session, I'm going to introduce to you Kelvin's lollipop experiment. Even though it's not in syllabus, it's a very good thing for us to learn how Kelvin actually used um, chromatography to help him find out the sequence of events that occur during Kelvin cycle. So how did he know that uh, RUBP come in first, followed by CO2, followed by unstable six carbon compound and break into GP and then followed by TP. How did he know that? So we want to know how he used chromatography to actually find out this thing, okay? So in uh, Kelvin's lollipop experiment, uh, the sequence of reactions in Kelvin cycle was discovered by Melvin Kelvin and his team in 1946 to 1953 in US. So he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1961 for discovering this Kelvin cycle. So this is the uh, diagram to illustrate the experimental setup that he and his team used okay, for this experiment. Now it's called lollipop experiment. By now you can see that it's called lollipop because there is a glass um, flask that looks like lollipop. right? This is a flask that looks like lollipop. That's why they call it lollipop experiment. So for photosynthesis experiment, you need the light. So there'll be a light source from the lamp, but the light, the lamp, uh, other than emitting the light, also emits heat. So we only want the light, but we do not want the heat because when you do experiment, the temperature must be constant. Everything must be standardized other than uh, something else. So therefore, we only want the light, we do not want the heat. So the light is passed through a very thin flask which contain the water to absorb the heat. So only light will pass through to this lollipop flask. So inside the lollipop flask, we must have got a cells that photosynthesize. So they use unicellular photosynthetic cell, which is called chlorella. Italic because it's genus name. Okay, chlorella is a unicellular photosynthetic organism. Unicellular photosynthetic, okay, or uh, cell, as well as organism, because it's unicellular, okay. So it will contain a uh, chloroplast uh, to photosynthesize, and this flask has to be flat. It has to be flat because we want to ensure that the distance from the light source all the way to here, okay, is almost the same in the entire uh, specimen. Almost the same, but not the same, lah. Okay as same as, as similar as possible, standardizing the distance. Because distance affect your distance of light, distance from light source, light source, distance from light source affects the light intensity. Okay? So light intensity is inversely proportional to the distance. Inversely proportional to the distance from the light source. So the higher the distance, the lower, the light intensity. So that's why we have to standardize the distance. Okay. Then, of course, photosynthesis, apart from needing the enzymes and the chloroplast, we need the CO2. So we got light, we got pigments, we got enzymes, we got chloroplast, we need CO2. And of course, water is from here, like inside a lot of water, because this is a aquatic organism. Chlorella is an aquatic organism, means they live inside water. So the CO2 will be supplied into the flask by bubbling into the flask, okay? And then the CO2 that's supplied is special because it's carbon-14 instead of the normal carbon-12. So carbon-14 is actually radioactive. It's heavy isotope, so it's radioactive, okay? It's a heavy isotope. So in the presence of light, chlorella will uh, take up the CO2 and convert into organic molecule. All right, so you undergo light dependent stage and as well as light independent stage. So as, so as soon as the lamp is switched on, the timer is started, all right? And there are a lot of this uh, uh, boiling tube which contain ethanol, boiling ethanol. So at a fixed time interval, a uh, fixed volume of the sample from the flask was taken into the boiling ethanol. 
Okay, like this one here is added to the boiling ethanol. So this part has been added, okay, from the specimen. So why you want to use boiling was the boiling ethanol will immediately denature all the enzymes. So the photosynthesis reactions will all stop then. Then whatever products, whatever substrates that are present there will then be able to be detected because it remains there. It will not be converted to anything else. Okay. So once collected, each sample is concentrated by evaporation and then loaded onto the paper chromatography. So then uh, he ran the chromatography with the extract from here after concentrating it by evaporating. Because if you don't concentrate, it's too dilute, you cannot see the results. Right? Okay. So um, he did a two-dimensional chromatography. So just now you saw is one-dimensional chromatography. This is two-dimensional, means they will run it two times. Each time, 90 degrees is to each other. So two pencil lines uh, are drawn and then the uh, extract is spotted right to the uh, uh, meeting line of these two lines. So first, it will be immersed in solvent A. So it immersed in solvent A, all the um, uh, molecules will start to separate by moving upwards. So you can see that there are four different spots. It means uh, four, probably four molecules have been separated. Okay. Then after that, the paper will be taken out and dried and turn 90 degrees. So can you see just now the movement is this way? Now the paper is turned 90 degrees and then placed into a solvent B, which is a different solvent. And then again, uh, run the chromatography to allow pigments to start to move upwards. Now, why you want to do a two-dimensional chromatography is that uh, you see in solvent A, right? When you see there are four spots here, one of the spots may contain two different molecules, but these two different molecules have got the same solubility in solvent A. So they move together and, and be separated to the same spot. So when you run a second chromatography using solvent B, then the previous molecule, two molecules may have different solubility in solvent B, even though same solubility in solvent A. So they start to separate into two different spots, like this one here. Can you see here? Originally in the same spot. Now, because in the solvent B, different solubility, they will separate into different spots. Uh, this is to ensure that you may not miss any molecules if they have got the same solubility in the first solvent. So after that, the paper is taken out and dried. Okay. And then uh, autoradiography is being done onto the paper. Autoradiography, you have to learn up this term. Huh? Autoradiography means uh, you put an X-ray firm onto the paper. Whichever part of the paper which contain molecules that are radioactive, it will actually darken it will the radioactivity will darken that part of the x-ray film to show where is the location of the pigment so the location will be shown by the dark spots on the x-ray film and then the concentration okay location is shown by the spots okay and then the concentration of those molecules uh, is given by uh, radioactivity on the spot, not on the spot, off the spot, off the spot. Okay, so there are two things you can analyze from here. So this is, you can see there are two square, right? One of the square is the paper, the inner square, the outer square is the x-ray firm. So put the x-ray firm onto the paper. So this is called OMA, OMA this is called autoradiography. Okay, autoradiography means you're using the X-ray. Okay, so any molecules on the chromatogram that are radioactive will actually darken the firm. Then we know the location of the spots. And then we can use a giga counter to count the radioactivity of the spots in order to know the concentration of those molecules in those spots. Okay, so after that, so this is example of the result. So this is a result after five seconds of photosynthesis. And this is the result after 15 seconds of photosynthesis. So you can see that comparing between these two, right? There are a few um, components. These two, these two are not present in five seconds, but it's present after 15 seconds. So this will actually show us that uh, during the Kelvin cycle, hexose bisphosphate 
as well as GP will be formed first, then only TP, which is this one here, can be formed. So this will actually tell us the sequence of events and the sequence of reactions, the sequence of intermediate products that will be formed during the Kelvin cycle. So this is how they actually find it out, which is a, such a wonderful um, um, technique, right? That they, they can they know what is chromatography and they use chromatography to help them to find out the Kelvin cycle. So this is very wonderful. Okay, so let's look at the result that they have plotted onto the graph. So based on different timing, they have collected different sample, run chromatography, and then do the uh, auto radiography and count the count the radioactivity. Okay, convert to total activity. So that will shows you that okay. Uh, GP will be formed first. And then as GP is converted to something else, uh, this sugar phosphate must be TP. So TP is formed, so start to increase, right? So it's a very good experiment. So a lot of you, uh, a lot of the things that you learn in biology, they are all uh, discovery by scientists. And it is not one year or two years, it could be five years or 10 years in order to discover a small portion. They could be spending their whole lifetime to actually get the results. And we only study in one hour or two hours or one chapter. So we really need to thank all of them for spending their lifetime, precious lifetime, doing all the experiments so that now we can easily enjoy the fruit of their uh, hard work. So you need to know that we are all very blessed because um, a lot of things are being discovered for us. And of course, we will now have the opportunity to also discover and make a difference to the life of our next generation to come and many, many generations to come. So that will make your life uh, quite meaningful.